Hello again, everybody. Good afternoon. If anyone outside can hear me, please do come in and join us. We're ready to start the afternoon session. So please take your seats, prepare yourselves for a, another exciting afternoon of activity and conversation. I know the tendency is going to be for a little bit of food coma. So uh, in order to try and discourage that, I'll give you a little teaser. In about uh, an hour from now, maybe a little bit less, we're going to announce the winner of the Mares Project competition. The eight projects that you heard about before lunch uh, were part of a, a process. They got screened and scanned and evaluated, and there's going to be a winner. We will announce that after the introduction to our afternoon session. So hopefully that'll keep you awake uh, as you wait for that in anticipation of what that happened. And I hope you guys managed to have a good conversation with the project developers during the lunch break. Anyway, so having said all of that, let's kick off the afternoon session. Using energy from the ocean is our opening theme for this first part of the afternoon session, and we're going to have an introduction and opening remarks from Dr. Tutai Kiratip Pongpaibun, who's the Director of International Strategy and Coordination Division at the Office of the National Economic and Social Development Council in the Kingdom of Thailand. Dr. Please come up. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to be attending this forum, which is an essential platform for discussing project pro prospects, constants, and implementation strategies, as well as addressing the way ahead in the new ocean economy. The previous years has, have also seen enormous and unprecedented um, change throughout the world. Promoting sustainable energy development had emerged as a considerable challenge for humanities. However, marine renewables are most likely to help us achieve sustainable, sustainable development and lift the advantages of our region's emerging ocean economy. While the ocean economic activities are rapidly increasing owing to changes in global population and technologies, one major in Predement to the development of the ocean economy is the continued deterioration of its health. Thailand understands these evolving and interconnected complexities, and we cannot overcome such hurdles on our own. With this, cooperation under IMTTTs and other corporations, especially BBLGAR, has remained relevant and has increasingly gained a pivotal role in supporting restorations of our regions throughout a number of key activities. To this end, Thailand has proposed the bio circular and green economies, or the BCG model, in which technology and innovation are leveraged to create value, reduce waste, consume resources more sustainably, and promote a more sustainable business model. The BCG model can also serve to accelerate the implementations of the UN 2030's Agenda for Sustainable Development. We can attend that the regenerative initiatives and measures discussed in this forum will be consistent with our BCG model and will greatly assist us in creating better policy regarding ocean energy. Thailand has integrated renewables into the National Energy Plan, or NEP, which is set to come into effect this year. With the global of jump starting the renewable energy transitions and achieving carbon neutrality by 2050s and net zero emissions by 2065, the energy plan also underlies the need to restructure economic sectors to expand and diversify the use of energy sources as outlined by the 4D1E, which is decarbonization, digitalization, decentralization, deregulation, and electrification. In addition, Thailand's new 13th National Economic and Social Development Plan, or the 13th Plan, has already been adopted with 13 milestones setting forth the way to reach our objective of being a progressive society and sustainable value creating economy. One of the 13th Plan, um, one of the 13th milestones of the 13th Plan is Thailand become the world's largest EV production hub. 
To accomplish this, we are resolved to convert the whole transportation system to green power by promoting the 30 by 30 strategies, which is to seek to have 30% of total vehicle manufacturing to be zero emissions vehicle or set EVs by 2030. Furthermore, Thailand's state owned enterprise or, that you can um, have heard about the PTT or the Petroleum Authority of Thailand in cooperation with several private enterprises such as Toyota Motor and the Bangkok Industrial Gas Company had installed hydrogen fueling stations to facilitate the seamless energy transitions. As a part of our effort to hasten the implementation of decarbonization policies, Thailand also signed a MOU to join a study and develop green hydrogen and ammonia projects with Saudi Arabia, aiming to create a green hydrogen production base in the region. Having said that, Thailand looks forward to increasing greater, greater engagement with key regional partners to exchange expertise on generating electric sorry, electricity from ocean energies so as to accommodate the rising demand of the EVs. The majority of Thailand is the land base. However, as the population goes, terrestrial resources deplete. The Thai economy is likely to shift a more ocean-based focus. With our gradual shift towards sustainable coastal resources, the littoral zones of the coast of the Gulf of Thailand have been established as the EEC or the Eastern Economic Corridor, with the goals of attracting investment and fostering manufacturing and innovations. Apart from the EEC, Thailand has established the Southern Economic Corridor or SEC as well in the static Southern Coastal Province, so especially target tourism while conserving marine resources. This will enable us to promote economic growth while simultaneously safeguarding and restoring the ocean health. In this regard, we emphasize the adoption of the blue economic concept in such areas as tourism and fisheries, as they will create opportunity for everyone, from, manufactur from manufacturers to SMEs, dealers, and suppliers. Developing a sustainable blue economy can therefore build the prospect prosperity of our regions and is cr critical for achieving SDG 14, which is life below water which almost appear to be common weakness among us, the IMTTs and the ASEAN countries. Given the interdependence uh, of uh, IMTTT countries on the oceans, as well as the rising severities of threats to the ocean health, an integrated approach to ocean ma management and other multilateral forums to allow policy exchange and knowledge sharing amongst relevant parties are urgently needed at present, Thailand ocean energy is in the research and development stage. In light of this, we welcome the involvement and cooperation of our stakeholders in addressing this matter further. In closing, I would like to express my appreciation to ADB, CIMTs, and NRA International for organizing this event today, and also to our stakeholders, both especially from the IMTGTs and the BBLK countries for actively engaging these conversations. I am very much look forward to the new height of corporations with deeper commitments from our members for the true benefits of our people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, one of the themes you mentioned, uh, green hydrogen, is going to be picked up in just a minute. We'll have a presentation on that for you. But first, as promised, a little earlier than I promised, uh, let's have the announcement of the winner of the Mares project. Here to present it, Jonathan Turner, director of NLA International. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's an honor to be able to um, present this um, recognition for the winner from the, uh, uh, from the Maros program. Marine aquaculture, reefs, renewable energy, and ecotourism for ecosystem services. For ecosystem services. Not from ecosystem, 
input with four ecosystems, a positive input back to the ecosystem. Back in uh, early 2021, we started the Mara's journey to capture inspiring examples of innovative thinking and practice in the marine space. Over 20 webinars have been given, uh, offering exposure to some amazing ideas since then. In the region of 50 applications have been scrutinized by a panel of experts. Today, we're joined by the eight innovators who have not only shown the strongest alignment to the Mara's principles, but also the eight innovators who've been able to provide the strongest articulation of the impacts and merits of their ideas. The panel of uh, expert judges underwent a process of some considerable scrutiny, uh, deliberation and discussion. On uh, their behalf, I have the honor to present the winning innovator to you all today. For their strong Maris thinking on uh, integrated multifunction development with marine renewable energy, in recognition of their inclusive strong gender component, impressed by their capacity building through capability development and education components with the potential to train people uh, in other locations as well as their current location, and uh, for demonstrating their ability to scale, allowing them to replicate their approach uh, across the region, Subic Blue are recognized as the Mara's winners. The judges really did find it hard to single out one team, and so have asked me to give honorable mentions to Tom at uh, Pacific Ocean Explorers, <laughs> Ben and the team at Deepwater Intake Infrastructure, powered by OTEC, <laughs> and Dr. Taz uh, for his uh, blue cooking uh, innovations. But may I ask you to put your hands together once more for all eight teams that are here today. I'd like the eight teams to stand up so they can be recognized. I urge you to spend time talking to them, uh, visit their, their stands, visit them as individuals, discuss their ideas. They all have their merits, and uh, they're all uh, worthy of recognition here as the, the, final, the final eight innovators from the Mara's program. Thank you. Jonathan, many thanks and congratulations once again to uh, Sue Big Blue. Well done. Uh, look forward to seeing that, that project develop and come on. Maybe we can all visit one day. All right, fantastic. Let's move on. Um, integration of the hydrogen economy and marine renewable energy is what we're going to consider next. This is going to be a video presentation uh, given by Ms. Inez Marquez, who's director for the Green Hydrogen Development Plan, the Green Hydrogen Organization. She's got a rec recorded message from the World Bank, UNIDO, and the Green Hydrogen Organization. No. It says here, recorded message, and here you are. <laughs> I beg your pardon, please. No worries, so... I am here, and yeah, it'll be hard to follow that very exciting uh, announcement. Um, but yeah, I think this, for me, this, this morning was such a great reminder of the huge potential uh, of the ocean energy and marine renewable energy to help drive the green hydrogen um, economy. And I also really appreciate the, the Mars approach to think about this holistically. So not just like we often do in the green hydrogen industry, think about how we can use offshore wind, floating solar, OTEC, to produce green hydrogen and its derivatives, but also to think about how it can um, link to other, other industries, for instance, producing green hydrogen, green ammonia, and green fertilizers for aquaculture, or um, producing green hydrogen and green fuels for um, the maritime industry and decarbonized shipping. So uh, thank you so much for um, that, that inspiration. Um, so my name is Ines Marquez. I'm from the Green Hydrogen Organization. And we are a nonprofit organization that has been um, established by a group of leading companies to really help scale up the production and use of green hydrogen worldwide, but to do so in a way that is sustainable and benefits um, local communities um, in emerging and developing economies. 
um, to help uh, highlight some of these opportunities, we have three recorded videos from uh, thought leaders in the green hydrogen space. So that's, that's enough from me, and I'm going to hand straight over uh, to Dolph Gillen, who's a senior energy economist at the World Bank and who's also um, coordinating the recently launched Hydrogen for Development Partnership, um, which we at uh, the Green Hydrogen Organization are, are a proud member of. Um, let's roll. Hydrogen is an important energy commodity in a global context with around 100 million tons produced and consumed every year. The majority of that hydrogen is today produced with significant CO2 emissions, but that will change going forward. The new technologies uh, currently being deployed, one of them is for the production of what is called green hydrogen. It's hydrogen produced through water electrolysis using renewable power. Uh, the cost of that green hydrogen are rapidly falling as the cost of renewable power have declined. And so that opens up new pathways to clean energy production and consumption. We need to focus on production, transportation and demand going forward. And there's a large number of projects under development, more than 500 are scheduled to be commissioned by 2030, but so far only around a tenth of these projects has reached financial investment decisions, especially few in developing countries. So there is a need to focus on the, these projects. Also in an islands and in a blue economy context, hydrogen can play an important role. It can be used to store electricity for mini grids. It can be used as a fuel for road vehicles, especially for heavy duty vehicles. Hydrogen ferries are currently being uh, deployed, and for ocean-going vessels, there is attention for ammonia and methanol produced from hydrogen as a shipping fuel. And finally, it's possible to produce synthetic jet fuel from hydrogen for aviation. So a whole range of relevant applications. Now, in a general context, the World Bank is supporting development through uh, its various programs. There is the IBRD and IDA support for governments, for the private sector, there's the International Finance Corporation, and there is risk mitigation instruments. And the World Bank uh, lending for financing for uh, climate is rapidly growing. It's around 30 billion uh, dollars a year uh, last year. There is also now a first loan for hydrogen for Chile and more, we expect a lot more loans uh, going forward. And it's a similar situation with other multilateral development banks. We see that uh, the attention for hydrogen is ramping up uh, worldwide. Of course, concessional financing is scarce, so that needs to be complemented uh, by other forms of financing from commercial banks and also from uh, the private sector. Now, in a World Bank context, we are currently working with more than 20 countries in developing hydrogen. So we have provided some kind of support, for example, development of, of roadmaps and, and strategies, studies about the economic potential, studies about the infrastructure needs, and the, uh, the socioeconomic impact of uh, deploying hydrogen. So, and we continue to uh, expand these studies uh, to more countries as global interest uh, of our client countries in uh, in hydrogen is on the rise. Now, to strengthen that support further, we have also established the Hydrogen for Development Partnership. The goal of this partnership is uh, to act as an advisory platform for knowledge sharing, capacity building, and financing for low carbon hydrogen. Uh, so far, there are 20 partners, but the number of partners is growing rapidly. It's associations, hydrogen clusters, and knowledge institutions. 
And in the next stage, we will also involve other financing institutions to really uh, support global uh, deployment of hydrogen. There are four work streams in this partnership, technology and energy systems integration, enabling policy and regulatory frameworks, investment financing and business models, and socioeconomics and sustainability. And across these four work streams, uh, there are currently priorities uh, being established and the work is taking off. So I very much invite you to uh, also engage in this partnership and see how we can accelerate global hydrogen deployment. So that concludes uh, my remarks. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And before I introduce the next uh, video from, uh, from UNIDO, um, great to see uh, many of the governments uh, represented here on the potential future engagement. Um, so, so really hope that, um, that the partnership can, can benefit uh, many of you. And on one of the members of the partnership is also the Africa Green Hydrogen Alliance, which is a regional uh, alliance of, of governments in Africa that we help um, coordinate to, to, to facilitate regional collaboration on, on green hydrogen, on everything from policies to mobilizing financing uh, to standards. Um, and hopefully um, such an alliance is something that uh, could be uh, explored uh, in, in Asia, given all the great references today to, to regional um, collaboration. So next up is um, uh, Petra Schwager, uh, who is Chief of the Ener uh, Energy Technologies and Industrial Applications Division um, uh, at UNIDO. A warm welcome from Vienna, from UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Within the UN family, we have the mandate to promote inclusive and sustainable industrial development for poverty alleviation. And this is aligned with SDG 9 that also covers innovation and infrastructure. Within our work, we have initiated uh, one and a half years ago our global program for green hydrogen in industry. You know that green hydrogen is produced from renewable energy sources and as such is an energy carrier that does not produce CO2 emissions when it is applied in industries. So green hydrogen is a means for countries to achieve their uh, Paris Agreement commitments, but also help to establish a new uh, low carbon industries. Green hydrogen can help, is of course crucial for decarbonization of the so-called hard to abate sectors, which at the moment are producing up to 15, average 15% 15 of the global CO2 emissions. Here we are talking about steel, cement, uh, ammonia production, uh, some parts also um, on the glass production. But in these sectors you don't have alternatives, so green hydrogen is an alternative. And business as usual is not an option, because if this would be the case by 2050, we would have eaten up all our uh, CO2 budget to reach the climate agreement of, uh, of Paris. But green hydrogen, and that's, and that's coming from the industrial development side also offers huge opportunities for creating new industries, for creating low uh, carbon industries in developing and transition countries. So it's not just a, an, another commodity, but it can be a really game changer, especially for the global south, to um, trigger new industry development, create jobs and mobilize investments. But it is, uh, it's not such an easy undertaking. We, are still, we still need standards. We still need, we, need, we still need capacities and skills for the production, but also for the application. We don't have sufficient investments. Mind you that green hydrogen production facilities and applications are big, big projects. So we are talking about 50 million onwards. Um, then, of course, we need the right policies and we need the right investments. So all in this, we have launched, as I mentioned before, our global program for green hydrogen in industry. And this program has uh, two pillars. And both pillars uh, have the aim to advance production, but also application of green hydrogen in developing and transition countries. 
So the two pillars, one is the global partnership and the other one is the technical cooperation program. The partnership program looks into building alliances with different partners and coming up with new policies, new finance instruments, um, working on certification. Uh, mind you, uh, at the moment we don't have a certification on green hydrogen. What is green hydrogen? So we are working, we have teamed up with ISO to work on standards that are look into CO2 content of standards. Um, policies, we are teaming up with ARENA um, to see what would be the right frameworks. And then of course investments, how can we bundle our work, we're working, we're very happy to team up also with the ADB but also with other DFIs to see how can we de-risk this. In. So our role would be the technical arm, how can we identify and de-risk investments and then that uh, DFIs can come in. And in this we have also developed a, a new model and this is the technical cooperation uh, angle to it that is called that are the so-called green hydrogen industrial clusters. What it, what it contains of is that you have a, a, in the middle a hard to abate sector. You are bringing the production of the green hydrogen close to the application, so you're also enhancing the efficiency. You bring also, you have to build up, of course, also the renewable energy uh, supply chain there, so renewable energy, electrolyzers, application in industry. And then when you do design these clusters, you never design them in such a way that you uh, have um, have only energy for the for the uh, green uh, green hydrogen production that you need in the industry. You always have a surplus. You always calculate like 10, 20 percent more, and this additional energy can be used to fuel other um, um, sectors in these clusters, or even to benefit to the surrounding population. Mind you, an inclusive setting up of green hydrogen production and application is essential. What, what is in it for the population surrounded? We are talking about um, many countries that don't have sufficient energy. So how can you justify that you use this energy for green hydrogen production? So you need to also bring something to the people. One kilogram of green hydrogen requires up to 10 liters of water that might have to be desalinized. Uh, how do you justify this? How can you make sure that this water that is desalinized is also given to the population around and eventually to agriculture. So all these aspects are being considered in our program where we are also working with our International Hydrogen Energy Center in China but also other partners. With this I'm very happy to um, come back to questions. Please do not hesitate to contact us and we are very much looking forward to partner with all of you. Great work from UNIDO there, and we'll also hear more um, later in one of the panel discussions around the financing side um, from, from a colleague from, from UNIDO. Last but not least, um, video uh, from the Green Hydrogen Organization from uh, our CEO, Jonas Moberg, um, my boss. Two point seven. Two point seven degrees is where we're heading with current policies current practices, actually even beyond that. And of course, we need to stick to one and a half degrees. So we have an urgent situation and we know what we need to do. We need to cut out the carbon emissions. And to do that, it's also fairly simple what we need to do. Essentially, we need to plug everything we can into the renewable grid. What we can't plug into the renewable grid, we probably need to put the battery in it's probably a good idea. We're still left with 10 to 20% of final energy use where you can't put it into the grid and you cannot put a battery into it. And that is of course where the green hydrogen economy comes in. And let's remember, green hydrogen is fundamentally about making renewable energy accessible. It's about manipulating, transporting, storing renewable energy. So what we need to do, of course, is to look very carefully, how do we get on with making that happen? I think it is very important then to start with government leadership. 
no matter how much we believe in the power of the private sector, in, in entrepreneurship and so on, it is the government that sets the rules, the policies that enables, that creates the enabling environment together with its partners, such as multilateral development banks, such as indeed the Asian Development Bank. And that is why I think that these kinds of meetings are so absolutely critically important and why we're very, very grateful to Priyantha and Steve and the whole team for bringing us together. And what I hope will become clear, not least during my brief introductory comments is, the solutions here again and again lies in us working together across disciplines and working together in the region. And we're seeing this not least when it comes to the green hydrogen economy, where we're fundamentally, at this stage at least, talking about very, very large projects. And to give you an idea of the size of the things here, one of the more ambitious governments in this space is India. They're aiming for 5 million tons of renewable green hydrogen by 2030. Only that 5 million, if you like, will require investments well over $100 billion. That is not going to happen by the private sector alone. It is, of course, going to require a huge amount of stimulation, stability, and conditions created by government and also then concessionary blended finance solutions where multilateral development banks like IDB comes in and plays a hugely important role. Sticking with that government leadership, there is of course also a lot that needs to be done in terms of rules and regulation, but not all just domestically, but also across the region and globally. And one of those areas is coming to the very basic need to define renewable green hydrogen. We must know what product we're actually talking about. And that is, of course, why the companies and some of the organizations behind our organization, the Green Hydrogen Organization, one of the first things they asked us to do was to come up with this, the green hydrogen standard that defines what is green hydrogen, not only in terms of emissions, maximum emissions, but also in terms of ESG requirements, land use, water use, uh, uh, and so on. These things need to be set out to make sure that we are doing this incredibly challenging energy transition in a responsible way, in a way that is genuinely sustainable. So that is a very important starting point where we've been working together with a number of, of organizations and where we're now rolling it out with some Indian companies, and some Chinese companies and so on to test it to make sure that we get the standards right. I also want to talk about the very, th these enormous needs of finance that I mentioned. There is no way we can do that just private or uh, with government or so. It will require collaborative, blended, concessionary solutions and de-risking, if you like, that we have not seen the scale of before. And this is what we try to identify in this publication. Um, that we worked on together with the Asian Development Bank and a number of others and launched last year. Looking a little bit at the numbers and what kinds of structures we need to make this happen as quickly as we want. <clears throat> and I really hope that you today are, are in a sense uh, uh, taking that conversation further. Lastly, I also want to uh, a touch on the fact that um, a, a particularly important area is also um, planning and permitting, while at the same time bringing our communities along with us. And it's for this reason that we're working together with a number of governments in the region and elsewhere to uh, and have set up something called the Planning for Climate Commission, because we need fast and efficient planning for renewable energy, for new infrastructure. We've got it for oil and gas and mining infrastructure. We now need appropriate rules for renewable 
infrastructure and it needs to happen quickly. But of course, at the same time, we must build trust, we must consult communities and bring everyone along. Otherwise, we are not going to have the support and the compact we need in order to get on with this energy transition. So those are some of the key building blocks that I think that we need to get on with. And Ines, who's there with you today, and I have been working together with the UN system and the African Development Bank within something called the Africa Green Hydrogen Alliance of governments coming together with others to help each other turning strategies, roadmaps and policies into actual rules, regulation and concrete funding. I think it is absolutely fantastic that the Malaysian government, our hosts today, have their one well, so early with their own roadmap. And now we need to take that sort of a, a, a visions and objectives and, and turn that into practice. And I hope that we'll be doing it by working together across the region. All of us, thank you very much. I want to help keep us on schedule, so I'll keep the closing very brief. Uh, but I think, as, as Nick said this morning, uh, we have the technologies, uh, we have the potential, but we don't have um, the scale. Um, so what we do need is continuous government leadership, enabling policies, combination of public and private uh, finance. We need to make sure that communities uh, benefit, and we need to, to work uh, across, across the region um, to make it happen. So look forward to further conversation. Three perspectives there on the green hydrogen story, the promise and hopefully the future potential of that. And thank you, Inez, for bringing them to us live rather than on video all the way from Norway. Okay, folks, we're going to shift gears a little bit here, both in terms of format and in terms of the content. The format is going to be a panel discussion. We're going to have more people on the stage to chat with. And in terms of content, we're going to now integrate, we're going to now consider the integration of micro, small, and medium sized enterprises into the new energy economy. I'm going to call out the panel members first, invite them onto the stage. They are Dan Millison, consultant, SDSC at ADB. Dan, please step up. Ms. Irene Olkaril, founder of Emerald Dream Services. Irene? Ms. Salma Ku, uh, of Jaringan Ecology Dan Iklim. Uh, Ms. Sarah Dole, founder of Invina. And Mr. Scott Countryman, Executive Director at the Coral Triangle Conservancy. And moderating this panel and asking the questions, James Elmore, founder and director of Island Innovation. Good afternoon, everybody. Should we try that with a bit more energy? Good afternoon, everybody. There we go. There we go. I know it's been a long day already, um, but let's try and keep up the energy for this panel because we have some fantastic speakers um, that are going to give us some very <clears throat> different insights on this topic. Um, as was introduced, integrating micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, MSMEs. You're going to hear that acronym a lot, so remember that one, into the new energy economy. Um, my name is James Ellsmore. I'm a former sustainability writer for Forbes and the CEO of Island Innovation. We're a media platform and communications agency focused on island development strategies. And um, we've heard today a lot about islands with the focus on small island developing states, which should be known as large ocean states, I think was very interesting. And of course, um, MSMEs are absolutely essential um, to take advantage of the blue economy effectively for island nations and coastal regions. So to kick off, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists one by one and ask them to do two or three minutes introduction, um, really to answer the question, what do you see are the big opportunities for MSMEs in the new ocean energy economy? and also what you would like to see addressed on this panel. So I'll go in the order I have here, and I think some of you I know have slides that you may want to share. This is the time to do that, so let us know when you, when you start. 
Um, and we'll start with Dan Milson, who is a consultant for the ADB. Dan is an energy specialist with over 35 years experience, um, including 20 years on clean energy and climate change financing. And he is currently supporting ADB's programs for innovative technology and business, business models in the energy sector and climate change operations, and of course, the Mares Technical Assistance Program. So, Dan, over to you. Hello? Okay, thanks. Uh, ha happy to be here. I've been involved in, in the Mares TA development, actually, from, from pretty early on. I think there's, there's definitely a big role for small enterprises to play in this, in this context of the, of the blue economy or the new, the new ocean economy and that subset of the new ocean energy economy. I could give you a lot of examples of how small companies op operate and are very catalytic in, in traditional extractive industries. I don't really want to, want to bother with that, but um, we'll, there, if we think about, um, we've been hearing early, earlier today about the use of renew, renewable energy to, to under, underpin power to X, and power to X is productive end use of energy. So we're not, we're, we're not talking about selling electricity, we're talking about value addition. And how can small enterprises play a role in that? I'll just give you a quick example, which uh, I think it was Admiral Lambert mentioned earlier, you know, the, hy the hypothetical wind, offshore wind developer who has no interest in marine aquaculture. Okay, well, I got, I got news for you, Mr. Offshore Wind Developer. Marine life is gonna grow on the stuff that you put in the sea, whether it's planted on the bottom or whether it's floating. And um, actually, there is a slide I have, if, if you could pull up, if, it, if we can get it and pull up the first slide, I've got a picture of what happens when you plant wind turbines on the seafloor. Um, the, but so the, wind, so the wind developer doesn't wanna be in the aqu aquaculture business, fine. Okay, this, is a picture of what's growing on a couple of wind turbines offshore Virginia a couple hours from my home. These are two prototypes, six megawatts each, for a 5,200 megawatt development, which is the largest offshore wind development in the United States. And this is what has happened after 18 months without any effort to augment the marine growth. Okay, now what, these are just the prototypes for the, big, for the big wind farm development. What's already happening there in, in terms of micro, micro enterprise or small enterprise, there are already sport fishing boats that go out to this place. Why? Because that's where the fish are. It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so now, now the wind, and uh, sorry, full, full disclosure, I own stock in the company that's, gonna, that's doing this wind project, Dominion Resources. I also, my home in Virginia, I, buy, I have to buy electricity from them too. Um, but the, so there's, a, there's a nat, going to be a natural growth of that, that marine life-based business in the wind industry. And one very simple thing that governments can do is to say, okay, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Wind Power developers, when one of the conditions for your contract for an offshore development area is that you have to include aquaculture development. And you don't have to do it yourself. All you have to do is bring a partner. You can sub this out. And that's where our, our, there's a logical space for companies that maybe are not small, but it's a pretty good way to crowd in small, small enterprise in, into this, and it's, and it's not complicated it's at all. It's just a matter of telling the developers, hey, sorry, here's an extra condition of what you need to do. And, and again, in the offshore wind business, this is pretty simple because we see this marine life everywhere. We see it off the Atlantic coast, off the coast of Virginia, which is not a marine bio, biodiversity hotspot. We see it in the Gulf of Mexico, we see it offshore California, we see it in the North Sea, 
and we see it in the tropical waters all around the world. Thank you very much, Dan, for that overview, and we'll be back to you shortly with plenty more questions, I'm sure. So the next uh, panelist is a familiar face you might recognize from one of the videos earlier, sitting right next to me, uh, Irene Okaril, who is the founder of Emerald Dream Services um, from the Pacific Island nation of Palau. Um, Emerald Dream Services is a cluster of small businesses that provides residential and commercial space rental services for guests such as local tourism operators. Um, Irene is also the founder of Palau Entrepreneurs for Growth and the former vice president of the Palau Chamber of Commerce and is an advocate for SME, MSMEs, I knew I was going to do that, in the Republic of Palau. So Irene, over to you. Thank you, James, and good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Palau, and congratulations, Subic Blue. Philippines is very close to Palau, so I'm going to have to go and uh, visit them more often. So, And I want to thank Steve Peters and ADB for making it possible for me to be here today. I am a representative of the private sector. I have my colleagues here who represent the government of Palau, and I'm glad that I could be here as well. Uh, the, Private sector is also very important. I um, am an entrepreneur at heart, and I truly believe that any uh, technology in the world that is uh, um, going to be put to use in the ocean, blue economy, uh, it will only work if you include the people, especially the local people on the ground. And so that's why I am a strong advocate for micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. And so uh, from the perspective of Palau, we are people of the sea. We have, uh, as uh, Director uh, Eden had shared, uh, our, our island is a large ocean state. So we have much more ocean than land. And so we are very grateful to be uh, able to uh, welcome technologies, blue economy technologies, to come and help our island of Palau. And the only thing I ask is let's not forget the people. The people and the culture. I have learned so far throughout all my experiences in the tourism industry and in the private sector that uh, post-pandemic going forward, 40% of all global tourism is cultural. Which means people, both local and visitors, will have to enjoy a new world going forward where, where they interact with one another and enjoy the various differences of cultures all around the world. And I hope it will also be the same for the Asia Pacific region. So thank you. Thank you for my, the opportunity to be here. Thank you for making the journey to be here. OK. <laughs> Uh, next, uh, we will go to Salma Ku, who is the president of the Climate and Ecology Network of Malaysia, which is a nonprofit currently researching urban development impacts on hill slope and coastal environmentally sensitive areas, documenting livelihoods of artisanal fishermen and organizing youth educational programs, cleanups, and mangrove planting. So, looking forward to the more local. Uh, insights into this topic. Over to you, Salma. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm also an islander from Penang, Malaysia. Um, can we show the slide, please? Yeah. So I'm more thinking about uh, how do you integrate the sort of the sharing of space with the local communities during the pre preliminary planning itself. And, um, you know, as we know, the interface between land and sea you have inter intertidal mudflats, uh, mangroves, seagrass, and coral reefs. So this ecosystem is very uh, optimal for fisheries. And that's why you have um, a lot of fishermen around that area. And when we think of, let's say, where do you put this new hydrogen infrastructure? I, I don't know very much about it, but um, let me tell you about fishing. There are different kinds of fishermen. So on this end, the inshore fishermen are the ones who are doing the small-scale fisheries, there are um, very good guidelines from the FAO on small-scale fisheries, and they are very sustainable. It's a very circular economy, um, and uh, they, okay, they, are the ones, they are not the ones who are doing the overfishing. 
Overfishing is on the other end, the deep sea fishing, who are the bottom trawlers, you know, uh, they, they, they troll the seabed, and there's a lot of reckless bycatch. So we want to help the inshore fishermen and, um, and make sure that, you know, that's also where the, the fisheries are spawned. That there is a, a, you maintain the ecosystem there. Next. Um, okay, so there's an area which is actually a fisheries commons. So we, have to, we can't think of the sea as a mare nullis, nullius, right? It's not a terra nullius, it's not an empty sea. It's actually a commons for the coastal communities, and they've been there for you know, hundreds of years. So um, they have uh, been a, they're stewards of the biodiversity of that sea. So um, we are actually trying to imagine we're, we're sharing the space with them. So how do we integrate them? How does the energy benefit them? But at the same time, uh, you know, instead of just uh, getting an uh, aqua farm, uh, aquaculture company involved, why not get a, the fisheries cooperative involved? Because they will also help you to look after whatever um, infrastructure you have and reduce the risk. Next. So, and then in understanding how they operate, it's not just, um, you know, like someone took a satellite picture and said, oh, look, there's no fishermen in this area. Because these fishermen, they're walking around 24 hours a day. They may not be there when you take the picture, right? Uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning, they're, they're already out at sea. And um, so we actually did this mapping project where we map the drift nets. They put the drift nets there, then they go back, and then they come back a few hours later. And uh, so it just shows you where they are active. And these fishermen, are, they're the natural phenologists. They read the climate. You know, they understand the tidal fluctuations daily and monthly, and also the monsoons. Okay, so um, you, you actually need to consult them. Uh, actually, we, uh, our NGO came in because we helped them to read re EIA reports. And they, they actually approached us and said, help us to read and respond to the EIA reports. And the EIA reports, usually, they assume static conditions, as if the sea is a... Uh, 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 go, go, what do you call it? goldfish bowl, right? So these fishermen, they are the ones that um, are very protective of, you know, they rescued the turtle, for example. You know, they, uh, they, they are very aware of uh, the other kind of sea life which is inhabiting and how, for example, the prawns migrate from one part of the sea to another state. So it is not just within that state, they actually, that the sea has no borders, right? So they cross the states and all that, and then they come back. So um, I think that they are the rep repository of local knowledge. And if you want to reduce risk, please consult them. Thank you, Salma. OK, so we've been to one large ocean state in the Pacific. And we'll now go to another large ocean state in the Indian Ocean, representing um, the other side of the region, I guess. So Sarah Dole is a physicist and entrepreneur who's the founder of Inverna um, in the Maldives. This is an organization looking to bring sustainable technologies to low-lying island nations in the space of construction, food, and energy. She is originally from Sri Lanka and has a background working internationally in scientific research, technology strategy, development, and commercialization. So. Sarah, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Yeah, thank you, James, and to the committee for giving me the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, so as uh, Admiral Lambert explained in his previous panel, there are vast opportunities to tap into for uh, this new ocean economy. Um, and there are so many different angles in which we can explore, um, you know, from energy to food to coastal protection. But like James said, I am from Sri Lanka and now living in the Maldives. But um, so what hits home for me and uh, the need of the hour basically is to reduce the risk and to sustain low-lying island nations in the face of rapidly changing shorelines. Um, so if you can pull up my slide. Um, 
um, you know, static solutions to very dynamic problems aren't often the best uh, solutions. Uh, so armoring like this, like sea walls over here, uh, you know, in severe weather patterns and uh, storm surges often fail and uh, with little to no intelligence or lack of intelligence, uh, you know, often uh, constrain adaptation to vulnerable communities. Um, and so currently developers, owners, communities use sand pumping um, in opposition, sand pumping or dredging in opposition or to uh, preserve their ground or to like create new ground. Um, but this is not like a sustainable solution and they're often costly and uh, more often than not, they harm the surrounding um, marine ecosystems. Um, so for me, I see an opportunity to bridge that gap and develop uh, regenerative um, adaptable solutions um, in terms of interventions. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. Um, so um, just to bring home to what we're doing, uh, so and give an example of what Inmena is working on. Uh, in collaboration with MIT Self-Assembly Lab, we are working with the forces of nature to construct rather than destroy. So um, here we are, uh, well, in collaboration with the Self-Assembly Lab, we are researching and developing um, a nature-based solution where we are able to create a system of underwater submersible structures that leverage the forces of nature. So they use wave technology, uh, sorry, uh, the wave energy um, and the ocean currents to promote sand accumulation in strategic um, uh, locations. And then we leverage uh, vegetation, so for example, mangroves, to stabilize sand in those uh, locations. So the hypothesis is basically, you know, sand uh, develops from top, uh, bottom up, and then the mangroves, you know, come from top down, and then there's a happy equilibrium, basically. Um, um, so over time, I guess the goal is that the self-organization of the sand will grow into uh, more ambitiously, new islands um, or help rebuild coastlines um, to protect coastal communities from rising sea levels. Um, so I think, uh, let me just explain this slide, but this is our second pilot uh, that we've installed in the Maldives in the Embudufinalu Lagoon. Um, so the installation is 20 meters wide, but uh, in four months we saw significant sand accumulation. This was in 2019. And to Dan's point, like, you know, without any intervention, um, uh, you know, we saw a huge uh, growth of marine life, like coral, barnacles, um, on our structures itself. And, you know, it became a home for a lot of lobsters and uh, uh, stingrays. Um, so that's the picture that you're seeing in the middle. Um, and if you are able to play the video, uh, you can see a tank model of, uh, you know, how our structures or how our network of structures should work. Uh, to accumulate sand in these strategic locations. Um. Can we do the video? Maybe not. Okay, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> uh, but lastly, before I close, I think... Uh, oh. and you can see with like the forces of uh, the ocean currents and wave energy you're able to accumulate sand in uh, strategic locations and that's just a model One last thought before I close off. Uh, building with nature is inherently hard and highly uncertain and unpredictable. So uh, to build with nature at scale, it requires predictive modeling. And uh, we're currently leveraging machine learning innovations uh, to build out solutions to mitigate those risks. Um, so yeah, long story short, I guess in a nutshell, I see a huge potential in uh, leveraging data for intelligence and nature-based solutions. Thank you very much, Sarah, for that overview. Okay, last but not least, we have Scott Countryman, who's the Executive Director 
of the Coral Triangle Conservancy in the Philippines. I'm very happy, just as a side note, about the range of islands we have on this panel. That makes my day. Um, Scott is the Culture Coral Reefs Consultant for the Mara STA and also has extensive experience in island-based ecotourism startups, marine transportation powered by renewable energy, and the emerging trends using Web3 AI blockchain technologies for natural asset accounting and management. He's also a US Coast Guard master's level ship's captain with a background in entrepreneurial finance and Pacific Rim business. Scott, over to you. Thanks, James. And it's an honor to be here. And uh, I'd say it's been fantastic to, to meet everybody here in the different projects. And I'm seeing more synergy as, as everybody gets together with similar ideas. Um, I started out as an entrepreneur in business and technology. And um, after, uh, after 25 years in the Philippines, um, it became kind of increasingly obvious that, that business success wasn't going to, uh, it was important to have an element of environmental because we were watching you know, these, these ecosystems that I've grown up around and loved all my life uh, dying. And so the idea was to take some of the ideas from business and apply them to models which motivate people in these remote island communities to do uh, the right activity, not out of um, the moral obligation because it's, because it's in their own financial best interest. So we started the Coral Triangle Conservancy to set up a networks of marine protected areas and quickly we found opportunities to use technology, um, the same technologies that we used in our, um, our online businesses and digital media distribution for dynamite detection, for example, fish bomb detection. And you know, you, when we, were, we started out you know, individually planting coral fragments to rebuild coral reefs, but then we would hear the, the fish bombs going off in the background and we realized that the larger problems after working in the field were the problem of fish bombing or the, the problem of unsustainable fishing methods, um, overfishing from commercial fishing vessels. And um, so I think that by being in the field for the last 15 years and helping communities to manage their fisheries and their coral reefs better, we've discovered a whole range of new problems that may not be on the front line uh, of people's agenda when it comes to conserving uh, ecosystems. And the good news is that there is uh, an unbelievable uh, variety of solutions to help some of the worst problems facing the environment. And one of our biggest challenges was how do you value coral reefs? Because there is, uh, unlike, you know, the, the, the tree has a value when you cut it down, the fish has a value when you catch it and you sell it as food. So. We've been innovating ideas of using um, uh, not only artificial intelligence and blockchain technology to put a value on natural assets as a way of natural asset accounting. And um, so in the, in the course of combining marine protected areas with this ability to do natural asset accounting, um, some of the most biodiverse, biomass rich locations on the planet now all of a sudden have a value. And it's, it's tough to, to finance the, the work that it takes to protect these places, but now we have a, a, a method to do that. And we simultaneously are solving two problems here. We're solving uh, poverty and malnutrition uh, issues by providing jobs for people to actually restore these ecosystems. And, um, and again, the, the richest places of biodiversity are often in these remote locations, and there is no commercial model uh, to help these places. So now um, the, uh, the Coral Triangle Conservancy has been successful in, in bringing together communities that are now motivated by uh, financial incentives to improve their quality of life with off-grid energy, with access to communications and education, uh, with electric powered boats. And these are all things that um, you know, the first world can bring to the developing countries to help reduce inequality and help them participate in the uh, rewilding of these natural places. It takes a moment, I have to. Okay, thank you very much to our panelists. So those introductions perhaps took a bit more of the panel than I expected, uh, but we've got some time now for questions. And I would encourage you, uh, any of the panelists, I have specific questions for some of you, but if you are dying to jump in, give me a wave and uh, I'll, I'll come to you as well. But I wanted to start off with Dan, um, as, as you spoke first. And as an ADB consultant, I think there's 
fellow panelists and people in the audience are dying to know what can the ADB do to help their small enterprises? What is the role of a big organization like the ADB in supporting uh, MSMEs um, in accessing the blue economy? Yeah, the um, ADB and other multilateral development banks do spend some effort on, you know, trying to help small and, and medium inter enterprise development. I think um, for for the ocean for the ocean economy, let me just give you a couple of examples of how you know what a what ADB is doing right now. There's a lot of emphasis on you know maybe you know we hear a lot about tech accelerators and all this, and I I'm. I'm kind of doubtful about how much effort we should spend on that because we we can we maybe should focus more on trying to bring financing to projects and rather than focus on technology development, which we've heard today, you know, that we don't need new new technology to to solve the problems that we're trying to address in in terms of ocean health, biodiversity, and climate change. What we need is deployment at scale. Now, how how can a multilateral development bank helps small and medium enterprises. A ADB, World Bank, and the others are really geared, their main business is doing large project loans, whether it's through sovereign lending where governments guarantee repayment or private sector, they're generally looking at, at you know, a, big, a big project. You know, in, in the oil and gas business, this is referred to as elephant hunting, right? Um, and that's what, that's what the banks do. That's, that's what they're geared to do. But there's, so the default, financing modality is the project loan. But there's another modality called financial intermediation. And the idea, the basic idea of financial intermediation is that ADB can provide wholesale finance to an intermediary, which could be a state-owned bank or a commercial bank or maybe a specialized financial institution. And then that financial intermediary does retail lending. And there's quite a bit of flexibility in how a, an, an FI loan, an FI investment operation can be structured. But it basically, ADB is the wholesale lender, and if it's a government loan, government's involved in the dialogue, and the financial intermediary agree on eligibility criteria for retail loans. And then here's the money, go out and do it. Let me give you two examples. In Palau, the National Development Bank of Palau is the recipient of uh, some funding that's actually grant funding to the government that's passed on to the National Development Bank of Palau as a below market interest rate loan. And that first tranche of money is $3 million. And that long story, but that's all committed to doing residential solar. And it doesn't have to be rooftop. It can be on the ground if you've got room on the ground, on the, on the roof or on the ground. But the National Development Bank of Palau is basically functioning as an aggregator of demand for residential solar. And in this case, we're pretty lucky because in, in Palau, there was already a policy framework and a regulatory framework. There's already been a rooftop, earlier stage of rooftop solar. There's net metering, all these things. All ADB had to do was say, oh, you know what? Instead of like trying to go build a utility scale solar power plant, Let's address direct, try to go directly to consumers and do, do this program through the National Development Bank of Palau. And then the, uh, the idea is, okay, if this first tranche is successful, we can add more money. And the, so the, the envisioned second tranche, which is being scoped out now, would be to maybe do larger scale commercial and industrial solar, again, distributed solar, uh, maybe electric vehicles with rental car companies. Some of the some of the dive operators and tourism operators are interested in doing rooftop solar or solar over the parking lots at their premises and maybe ele electric boats. And thinking even farther ahead, there's a there's a third tranche envisioned that would be for Mares types types of investments. So aquaculture, uh, other uh, tourism operations, <clears throat> whatever. So. More, a more specific uh, example on blue economy, uh, last year ADB's board approved uh, an investment operation from ADB's private sector operation in the Maldives, 
that's, that's clean energy and blue economy. This again is financial intermediation with a, a non-sovereign loan, the government's not gonna guarantee repayment, a loan to the Bank of Maldives and the eligibility criteria, there, I won't go into detail, but it's clean energy and blue economy, so it's Maris and et cetera. And the, there's some specific targeting to small enterprise, small enterprises, locally owned companies. So Sarah, I don't know if your company would be eligible to borrow from that facility or not. And female headed in, enterprises. So the, these are things that are actually, even though they're not um, a, a large, don't comprise a large part of ADB's lending portfolio, they're, they're fairly straightforward to do in terms of you know, the, we, we know how to do those. I myself, as a consultant, have helped ADB do, do a few of these things, and it's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. It's just a matter of carving out what's, what's the end, what, what, who are the end users that we want to help where we want to try and cover a large number of transactions that aren't amenable to doing a project loan. In, in summary, just for someone, for a practical piece of advice, someone who says, okay, ADB is this huge organization, where do I even start? I have a project that I think is fundable. What would you say to them? How, how should they start in interacting with an organization like ADB? Um, <clears throat> well, if the government's not helping those inter enterprises to begin with, then pri private companies going directly to ADB and asking for grant money don't waste your time doing that because that's not going to happen. Um, you, what you really need to do is find a large partner that has deep pockets that can go to ADB's private sector department where you could talk about some, some kind of a non-sovereign non lending, lending program. But the, the, to, to, to just to come around on that, on that point, if, if governments want small and medium enterprises to get help from multilateral development banks, one of the best ways to do it is to come up with a, with a program where they say, okay, let's do X, Y, and Z to help sp a specific group of enterprises or specific sectors, market segments, and government goes to ADB and requests a sovereign loan to support that, and, then, and, that, and that loan from ADB will not be covering 100% of the retail financing. Right? So there's some natural crowding in of, of private participation. Retail borrowers are expected to come with some of their own, own collateral. Um, and another, another point on that, specific to the new ocean economy, is that if there's a need for concessional money to come in, the concessional money can, come, can be brought in as co-financing on a financial intermediation investment. And a, a couple of fine, fine points here is that if, we're, if we look at micro enterprises or small enterprises and a commercial bank is looking at one project, they see all the risk of that one project. But if they're doing 100 projects of a similar nature with similar risk, the risk of individual projects is spread across the portfolio. Now, if you need risk coverage, which is there's a lot of perceived risk in new ocean economy investments, then the soft money doesn't actually need to go and subsidize the retail project. The soft money can go in as portfolio insurance and held in, in reserve as standby. You know, it's like, like yeah. it's kind of like mortgage insurance in, in the United States. You know, it's standby uh, letter of credit for potential portfolio loss on non-performing loans. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go to Irene next, and as a small business owner, would welcome any of your thoughts on what, what Dan has said, but I wanted to specifically ask you about your work in tourism and what the role of small enterprises in tourism is in a country like Palau or other large ocean states, specifically how those types of enterprises that you have contribute to preserving the local environment, preserving the local culture, which I think is very important to you. Um, so yeah, would welcome your comments on that. Thank you, James. Uh, perhaps uh, if it's not too late to play the slide deck I have for Ongtao Nature Resort Palau, that might prepare you for what I'm about to say. And I don't think it's very long, it's just gonna go quickly. But I really appreciate what Dan has shared because uh, to tell you the truth, I have never approached ADB as a private sector. 
I didn't even know they had uh, programs for private sector. I thought ADB was only helping governments. And yes, ADB has helped the government of Palau very much, especially during the COVID times. And uh, one of the projects I think they're launching in Palau is something to do with taro, like taro, you know, taro pads, taro entrepreneurs who are in the taro fields, farmers. Um, but it, it is very enlightening to listen to Dan because uh, from the private sector point of view, I've always thought, you know, Palau having its number one economic driver being tourism, what are we going to do now, you know, if uh, it's, it's not possible? Keep I'll keep going. Uh, Palau, the number one economic driver for Palau is tourism. So of course, when the lockdown happened in March of uh, 2020, lockdown, no planes, no ships, nothing, then of course the local economy collapsed and the Palau's government was in dire need and have had to uh, request loans from ADB to be able to survive. So I had thought about that and then looking around Palau, we had been colonized all the way up to the end of World War II we were taken you know, under the administration of the trust territory of the Pacific Islands. And so the local people have been sort of uh, uh, throughout our history, have become a bit dependent. So in 1994, when we, we became an independent country, it, uh, it has been a challenge to get micro, small, and medium enterprises with that work ethic of what the cultural people know from their history and their Palawan culture of 3,000 years ago up until now naturally have a work ethic and a way to run their own domestic economy to survive. We are, of course, an island where everything grows and we are a large ocean state where we, our marine resources are, are more than sufficient but we also realize that uh, with climate change and global warming, it has affected our, our environments a lot. And it has also affected a lot of our um, local cultural traditions and practices where people are seeking ways to survive on this little group of island. Uh, a lot of out migration happens because people look for ways to find uh, livelihoods. And so this is where I come in thinking, if 94% of food is being imported into Palau, if the pandemic has affected the tourism industry, what can we do to recover? And I thank ADB for helping the Palauan government but I certainly hope that ADB would also look into helping the private sector because otherwise you'll come to Palau and there won't be many people around anymore. I think Scott's been there quite a few times, so he knows. Um, the only way to move forward is to try and give the local people an opportunity to be entrepreneurs, to actually do what they normally do to survive, but be able to turn each of their activities into livelihoods. So I was hoping that you would play Ongadawal Nature Resort Palau to give an example of what I've been preaching in Palau all these years, especially throughout the pandemic, is we have to take it into our hands as landowners. We Palauans have in our constitution that only local Palauan citizens can own land. We have to turn our land and sea, which are full of resources, into our own livelihoods. So is it possible to, it's not the video that I'm asking for, it's the slide deck. I think you've seen the video already, but is there a possible way to uh, play the slide deck? Oh, well, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate if we can't because then you won't really understand where I'm coming from. A local entrepreneurship program for the island of Palau. If ADB and other investors in this room would be interested to see the beautiful pristine 
islands of Palau and see how livelihoods can be built, it would be very helpful to see how entrepreneurs could work and turn their lands and see around them into livelihoods. Thank you very much, Irene. And I think the point you made about the food security and also especially for the Pacific, the health implications of the food security situation is something that often gets forgotten in the blue economy conversation. It's there, but I don't think it has the prominence. And especially for the Pacific, it's very important. I, I wanted to go to Salma now. Um, Salma, and I'm curious to know what resonates from what Irene said in, in the context that you work in. Because I'm presuming it's a less tourism dependent area. Um, and you, you talked about fisheries as well. Um, so in terms of, um, I guess, balancing when, when looking into the blue economy, balancing both the cultural elements with the environmental pr um, preservation locally? Okay. Um, actually, we have in the north part of the island that is actually the tourism area for Penang. And, uh, you know, the, the, it has really beautiful beaches uh, on the north northeast side. But those beaches are now totally uh, degraded because of a reclamation project somewhere else. So I'm very, I think I would be very careful about, um, you know, uh, creating sort of artificially creating this sort of sand accumulation because it may borrow from one place and it may, the, the sand may migrate from another area. And as a result of that project, we, we then get very uh, large um, mangrove. The, the mangroves just expanded on the other side. And nobody predicted that. I'm sure all the people who did the hydraulic modeling couldn't have foreseen that. You know? So it, more mangroves, uh, less beach of the original beach. And you know, so it just moves around. And, and very hard to understand and predict. Um, I think uh, the, the stakeholders, there are so many different types of stakeholders. You have, uh, of course, people in the tourism industry. You have the fishing community. And um, you have in a way, global stakeholders in the sense of we want to reduce carbon, we want to regenerate the ecosystem, um, but it affects uh, different people in a different way. And so this ethos, ecosystem ethos is so important. And the, the, the E in Mares has to stand for equity as well. Um, so uh, we have also seagrass bed, which is now, I think, the largest in the peninsula. Um, and that, uh, there, has, there are ferries going you know, back and forth, and if, if the ferries were running on hydrogen, that would be so much better for the seagrass, right? So the, the, when you get down to the local level, there are so many complexities, right? And um, uh, the governance is so important. The, it's basically, you know, we cannot assume that the public sector will make the best decisions for all the stakeholders, right? Because they are also, they are also in a way, uh, sometimes acting almost like the private sector. Um, and I think you, you get that in every, every country. But it is never stated because we assume that the public sector acts for the public. And that is a big assumption. So there has to be some, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, d diligence or, you know, or in, with, from the project funders to make sure that, uh, you know, in terms of the site selection, the preliminary planning and you know, the, the consultation of the stakeholders don't just rely on our EIA because the EIA process is very flawed. Mm -hmm. And even when the, the government approves the EIA, um, you know, even the consultants, even the, the consultants are appointed by the project proponents. So what, what do you expect? Uh, so I think the governance aspect is very important. Thank you, Salma. And I've just been told we have five minutes left. So uh, we'll try and cover the rest of the ground as much as we can. I'll go to uh, Sarah now. So um, we, we've already discussed over lunch this a little bit, the importance of MSMEs in innovation. I think that um, it's very, or let's say, it's harder for large organizations to be as nimble and to have the innovation. So that's why this is, is, is so important. It'd be great to hear a bit about your experience and also the role that MSMEs have in building local resiliency for the economy? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so MSMEs and startups are what lighthouses are like to ships for me. 
um, you know, they're able to scout for new opportunities and uh, areas of innovation. Um, and because of their nature, they're entrepreneurial in their nature, right? And so they're able to fail fast, fail cheaply, work in an agile manner, take on this big risk appetite. Um, and so they're able to bring solutions to the marketplace much faster than um, a typical corporate or industry would. Although in my case, it's been six years, so <laughs> that's because of lack of funding. Uh, but um, so that's one thing that I see, uh, you know, MSMEs and startups doing, working nimbly to bring solutions out to the marketplace faster and spotting new areas of innovation. I think interestingly, the second thing is that, you know, they could be used, um, so the work that startups and MSMEs are doing could be used as a strategic tool because they're kind of providing a glimpse into the future. Um, and you know can give you trends and stuff like that. So um, what patents are to the intellectual property world? You know through patents you're able to identify trends um, and areas of innovation for typical industries. So similarly through the work that um, MSMEs and startups are doing, you know industries can use this as a strategic tool to look at and derive insights from um, you know where ocean economies are headed and trends. So I think those two things are, uh, you know, what MSMEs bring to the table. Um. And we could spend hours discussing access to finance for MSMEs if we, if we had that, that focus. There's a lot of conversation to be had there. So Scott, we'll have the last word with you. And in, in your briefing that you sent me, you said that the best value for money is to set aside 30% of coastal waters in no-take locally managed marine areas. I picked that statistic up and I, I maybe you can explain that a little bit but also what, what I'd like you to talk about to wrap up is achieving this balance between the industry let's say side of the blue economy with the conservation side how do we find a, a balance between those two yeah I think there's a couple interesting points here that have also been made and, and Irene talked about um, you know the, there is a will uh, we have over a dozen locations across the Philippines where we're doing our marine protected areas or locally managed marine area projects. And there is definitely a will to um, be entrepreneurial, but often they lack the capacity. So this is another issue is that it gives an opportunity for franchise operations or maybe Subic Blue or uh, the Pacific Ocean Explorers to take their methodology and bring it to these locations um, and, and be able for them to, um, to adopt and be trained on how to do it. Because you know, if you're a subsistence fisherman all your life with less than a high school education, it's pretty tough to become a, an entrepreneur like from the city who has exposure to all the technology tools and all the everything. So back to your question, um, those are just comments on previous um, statements there, but back to your comment on um, the 30 by 30. It's a, really it's a really nice, easy thing to remember. If we can reach 30% of the coastline set aside in coral and fish nurseries, the spillover effect actually benefits the entire coastline. So we're actually telling communities to fish less, fish less to catch more. And, the, and it works. And I mean, it's been shown scientifically that it works. Um, so often, sometimes people come in with these big, complicated, difficult solutions where the easiest thing is just stop overfishing. You know, and the cheapest thing is stop overfishing. In Palau, with 80% of their total EEZ has been set aside as no-take marine sanctuary. That is revolutionary. And time will tell, a decade from now, maybe even sooner, that what Palau has done there is absolutely the direction that countries should take, especially the large ocean nations. Their primary value of their countries is their natural resources. And by selling out fishing rights to and a, and a company abroad for so a handful of individuals in those companies can become super rich is not in the best interest of those small developing nations or large ocean state countries. So um, you know Sylvia Earle and other famous ocean ocean uh, experts have promoted the concept of this 30 by 30, and um, it, and reefs that are uh, conserved that aren't being overfished are more resistant to climate change. And I, and I guess if I was gonna end with anything here, it would be the comment that no, no extent of coral reef rehabilitation efforts and other conservation efforts for coral reefs are gonna be effective without action on climate change. So decarbonization of the global business 
in every single way possible is essential for coral reefs globally to be around two decades from now. And so everything that we do as uh, an NGO is done with renewable energy and regenerative. And um, if we're gonna find a uh, relationship between big business and what's happening in these remote locations that still have beautiful biodiversity, it's that they have to really accelerate the change to renewable energy and uh, a shift to um, being more aware on uh, climate change issues. I think that was a very good note to end on. So thank you very much to the panel for this conversation. It was an absolute privilege to um, be here with you. And just to end, a big thank you to ADB, IMTGT, NLA International, everyone who's put this effort into this fantastic event today. It's been really a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll wrap up there.